Uh, it's good morning over in Australia. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Um, this is the, um, the first webinar and the first Goji in webinar in, two, in 2017. Um, you may know now that we do these webinars basically every first Wednesday, every first Wednesday of, of, of every month. We normally do them at 4, 4 p.m. Um, UK time, but today basically to to be able to accommodate our great speaker, we 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 get into you a little bit later than 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 usual. And um, for those of you who join us for the first time and you haven't heard about the GoGN, the GoGN is the Global OER Graduate Network, and uh, it's basically a network of of uh, PhD students around uh, around the world and and friends and experts and basically what we're trying to do is work together to to um, raise the profile of research into open education and support those of you who are doing your research, your PhDs, in, in, in an aspect of open education. And of course, also to think about, um, about developing openness as, 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 the, as the process of, of, of uh, research today. Um, this seminar is, is, um, is, is being recorded, okay, and it's going to be released under a CC BY license as soon as this, uh, as, as soon as the, the, the webinar is, is done, basically. Well, I'll probably wait until tomorrow morning, but it, it's, it's going to be available under a CC BY license on our YouTube channel, and that includes the content of the chat, okay, there is no way I cannot um, you know, delete what you're saying in the chat. So everything's being recorded, okay? Uh, uh, so that's it. So that's me. So with that, I, I am really happy uh, to introduce you to, to Adrian. Adrian, you can talk a little bit about yourself if, if you want, but um, this is, I mean, it's it's great, and I encourage everybody. So Adrian is is a member of of, of the the GoGN. He's he's also a PhD uh, candidate, and um, he's here sharing his research with us. So this is again an open invitation for anyone who wants to to do um, the, 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 this kind of, of presentation, like uh, like Adrian tonight. Uh, you're all you're all more than welcome. Just uh, you know, give me a shout, and I'll. I'll be very happy. We'll all be very happy to accommodate you. So that's it. I'm, I'm going to now uh, pass on the microphone to Adrian. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much, uh, V. I'm very, very happy that um, I was uh, that I was accepted to come and speak with you all this morning. And uh, and you can already tell, of course, from the the slightly false start to begin with, uh, that uh, slight, slightly nervous to be sharing here because one of the things that I noticed as I was watching the the Twitter feed around this was that the number of people who were boosting the signal, who were actually researchers that I hold in very high regard and people that I quote on a regular basis, and so as as a result, I was sitting there thinking to myself, well, as a PhD candidate. Um, I, I, I feel a little bit daunt. It feels a little bit daunting to have these people in the audience, as it were. Uh, that said, however, to introduce myself, my name is Adrian Stagg. I am currently the Open Educational uh, Practice Manager at the University of Southern Queensland in uh, Australia, and I'm a PhD candidate with the University of Tasmania. This presentation here is based on some of the work that I've been doing around the conceptual framework for my own emerging research into the Australian experience of open educational practice. And it's very heavily uh, built on Bronfenbrenner's uh, Ecology of Human Development. So this morning, uh, in terms of what you can expect, is uh, some questions for you. I am very keen to hear uh, from the people in the audience as well and also I've got a couple of activities as we go through just to really contextualize the types of things that I am talking about uh, definitely an overview of the ecology of human development and how it applies to open education research uh, a small amount of poetry which again actually uh, does serve its purpose and a short trip to the dark side of openness but I promise that we will come back out into the light much before the end of all of this. 
So let's start off with the concept that, of course, as we are all gathered uh, around the notion of open educational resources, over the last 15 years, of course, we've been told that there is quite a lot of promise for sharing and for opportunities for education, both for scaling it up, uh, also reaching uh, brand new learners who may not have had equitable access to higher education or indeed any other type of education in the past. And so really as part of this, um, we have to also consider, I feel very strongly, the individual practitioner within a general environment or an ecology of openness. Often uh, we see that there are interventions or that there are programs which are set up uh, which on the surface don't look as though they are contextualized for local environments. Of course, once they're actually run with people on the ground, that's the point in which you start to draw in individual experience and to bring in this idea that every single person approaches openness in a very different way. Part of this, of course, is I lean on Susan D'Antoni's work from 2007-2008, which was the published in The Way Forward, which was the deliberation of an international community of interest in openness. And this brings us to the first point where I would like you all to consider where you are in the world at the moment. And I want to start off, first of all, by thinking about you as an individual. So if we take some of the priorities for action around openness, and I've got some on the screen here at the moment, what I would like you to do down in the chat is to make a post which has got your country, where you are currently uh, living at the moment, where you're currently working, and then I would like you to pick two of the priorities for action on that list and just put them after it. And I want you to consider this purely from the perspective of you, the individual. So what do you consider are two of the priorities for you? So I'll just take a quick look in the chat and, and, uh, and we'll be able to grab a few of these. Okay, so I can see Beck's already posted, thank you. And, and also Chrissy. Thank you, Jenny. And Helen, okay. <laughs> Thank you, B. And Catherine. Okay, Nick and Lisa are there as well. And Caroline. Very interesting, because as, as I take a look through, um, I'm seeing research come up quite a lot. I'm seeing awareness raising uh, as either number one or two. I'm seeing uh, sustainability uh, coming in there as well. Okay, thank you, Eliza. Awareness raising sustainability. Excellent. Yeah, that's a very interesting point there, Chrissy, that no one said community at the moment. Uh, very interesting. But what you can see already is just taking a look at that list there. People are interpreting this very differently for their own individual context. And then what, um, what, you find from there, and Lisa's pointed out that she wanted more than two. Uh, I didn't know how much time this would actually take, so that's why I, I said that we would just take two to start off with. But already, people are starting to put these in very different ways, uh, whether or not research is a priority, awareness raising, sustainability. Um, interestingly, there were some on that list there, quality assurance, um, standards that didn't actually uh, make it onto the list, and as Chrissy noted, uh, communities as well. What I would like you to do now is that I would like you to take a slightly bigger uh, picture now, and I would like you to consider um, whether or not there are any changes if you actually take that up to the institution or organization in which you work. So what I would like you to do is take it from the individual and now think about that if you were able for a day to tell your organization or institution, these are our two priorities for openness, what would you pick? So post down again, just country and the two priorities for your institutional organization, please. Okay.
right -o. awareness and policies, culture, quality assurance um, now starts to come in and standards, sustainability. Okay, Helen uh, from the Open University has got awareness and community, policies. Uh, culture's not on my list, but um, that that is true. Uh, <laughs> let's put that one under community, shall we? Okay, and again, what's very interesting here is that when we actually shift the perception of what a priority is from the individual, where we get things like awareness raising and sustainability and research, when I shifted the focus to institutions and organizations, what we ended up with was um, a focus on things like quality assurance, policies, standards. We still had awareness raising that, that crept in, but there was a very different focus. And so I consider that this is, is incredibly unsurprising because we're talking about very different levels of uh, of engagement with openness. And so again, this notion that the context is everything really does come to the fore. Even with our group this morning, just a very strong shift. And I'm sure that if we then actually said, well, let's take that up a notch again to your entire country, uh, I'm very certain that, um, again, we'd probably have some of those policies and sustainability quality assurance, but there would be slight changes again. Um, and I do agree, um, I've, I've seen down here that, um, that as people are, are still continuing the conversation down here, that's, that's excellent, um, that people are, are starting to consider as well what the role of some of these priorities are. Now, I've spoken about what the types of priorities are available at different levels. Also, this idea of scaling education up and creating education more equitably. And this is the point where I'm going to start to lead us further into the dark side, as you would. Uh, this, is, um, this is probably one thing where a cautionary tale, if you would, around the idea of how open education could, in fact, be co-opted uh, for other purposes. Now, in 2012, in the... MOOC hype that was occurring. Sebastian Thrun of Stanford University, who, um, who was also the founder of Udacity, uh, very boldly said that simply due to the presence of MOOCs, that 50 years after the beginning of the first MOOC, he gave an estimate of how many universities would be left in the world. Now, we are five years on from that, so we're a tenth of the way into, into uh, Sebastian Thrun's vision for the future. I want people to have a bit of a guess how many universities globally did he say we would be down to? Have a quick guess. Was it 10,000, 1,000, 100? Uh, just it, if if you do know the answer, please put it in as well. Okay, so we have it. We we have twenty, nine, ten, a hundred. Uh, Fifty two. Okay, that's frightening. Uh, <laughs> four. Okay, so we have a wide range here. In fact, what he said was that because of the ability of open education. Uh, scale up and to provide opportunities for learners. He said that within 50 years, we would actually end up with no more than 10 universities globally. Now, of course, as people who are employed in, yes, indeed you do, Jenny, you do win. <laughs> uh, now, as people who are employed in higher education, the idea of there being 10 universities worldwide raises an awful lot of questions. Uh, one of them, of course, being that who's on that list of 10? Well, unsurprisingly, Udacity is on the list of 10. But the other nine are actually very heavily European 
and North American, which actually means that if, if we take a look at that very critically, uh, and I, I quote God, Godwin Jones from this, that it's very likely that North American and Europe are very heavily, if not exclusively, represented in the group. And this is certainly a paternalistic, if not downright neo-colonial perspective on higher education. It assumes that education can be served out from universal knowledge centres without regard for local pedagogical and cultural concerns. Concerns. And it's when we start to talk about ed open education and when the discourse is co-opted in such a manner as to give us these kinds of nonsensical efficiencies, if you will, that context is abandoned completely. And this is part of the reason why uh, context and also the local practitioner experience is such a very large part of my research. So I'm going to move on to something a little bit brighter. Um, and as I promised you that we would leave the dark side and come out into something a little bit lighter. At my desk, and, and I can see already um, that, that a few people are thinking, why on earth has he got polar bears? Okay, this is part of my, my presentation style, is that generally speaking, my slides make no sense without me, uh, which I consider to be moderately successful. Now, the polar bear here is to remind me of a poem that I actually have sitting up at my desk. And it is specifically to remind me that there is another um, side to every single story. And this one is actually from a, a poem by a fellow by the name of Les Barker, uh, which is called, Have You Got Any News of the Iceberg? And I'll share with you the, the first um, part of that, that poem, the first few lines and the refrain so that you get an idea. It goes something like this. On a cold rainy night on a Liverpool quayside in the years before the Great War, the world was in shock at the loss of Titanic, so proud had they been days before. Relatives gathered for news of their loved ones, to read through the list of the dead, when into the throng came a sad-eyed old polar bear, and to the clerk at the counter he said, Have you got any news of the iceberg? My family were on it, you see. Have you got any news of the iceberg? They mean the whole world to me. And it goes on as the polar bear is trying very desperately hard to get any news of the iceberg whatsoever because his family were coming down from Greenland on the iceberg and, uh, and he says that he's very, very sorry uh, that all of the people, of course, died, but he, he's also very keen to have any sort of information about his family. And I keep this at my desk to simply remind me uh, of the fact that there is always a different side to every single fa uh, every single idea. Um, and I see already that it's resonating with a few of the people in the chat. And so uh, my, my sort of phrase that every now and again I get people quick physically looking at me is that I'll have a bit of a breakthrough and I'll, I'll, I'll immediately say it's news of the iceberg. Um, they all look at me as I'm completely daft. But uh, this is something that we do definitely need to consider and we'll move now into the idea of the, the uh, ecology for human development. So why on earth do we pick Bronfenbrenner for this or why on earth have I picked it? Well. Very simply, it is because it is all about understanding how people develop and also how people approach the systems around them. So uh, Bronfenbrenner was a psychologist and uh, one of the really good things about being a PhD student is that I get to be all dreadfully excited uh, about stuff that is brand new for me that everybody else looks at me and says, yes, we've known that for the last couple of decades. Uh, but it's one of those things about being a PhD student. And the way in which Bronfenbrenner looks at this is to say that every single individual is uh, influenced by and influences a range of environments around them. And the four systems that I have here, which I work my way through, uh, are part of every single person's reality. And every person's reality is, of course, constructed slightly differently. So at the heart of all of this is the individual. But then when we come out and think of this as concentric circles, you start off with a microsystem. And this is the lowest order 
of influencers, or at least the most most personal. This is the interactions and interrelationships that you have within your most immediate environment. So it will include your peer relationships and also your personal working space. So anything which occurs within that very close proximity to your own self is part of your microsystem. When we go out to the next uh, part, we have the MISO system, which is wh what happens when you get a we start to interact with each other. This is definitely all about individual context, because let's say, for example, the person who you are at work in that immediate environment with those immediate peers is probably a different person to who you are at home, which is a very different immediate environment, and you have different people around you. Now, often, micro uh, the the interaction of your microsystems will be a fairly positive thing because you're able to draw things from one context in order to inform your practice or your behavior within another microsystem what can however happen is that if there are any situations where your perceived role within a microsystem is actually very very different um, what can actually happen is a bit of dissonance when microsystems together if you believe that you have a very different role in the two separate microsystems but they for some reason have come together and then what you actually have is an internal conflict around what your role actually is within that system uh, very much what Lisa's saying here a, a sort of a clash of cultures as, as it were the exosystem is a much larger system on top of that, which is often things that you have no control over, but will provide some sort of direct influence over the way in which you go about your practice. So in higher education, you can look at exosystems as being things like institutional policy. So for example, if you work for an institution with a very stringent intellectual property policy, which says that no, everything we produce produces proprietary or if you're working in an environment where your institution has decided that they want to aggressively commercialize everything then your personal values around publishing openly around teaching openly researching openly that's going to have a massive effect on how you interact with that exosystem and then if we go even larger, the macro system is the largest part of the ecology. So the macro system is often at a cultural level, at least a national level. And there are a range of influencing factors here, which can be things like disciplinary uh, culture, and we know that dis disciplines are almost their own tribes, that they behave in very particular ways. So that's disciplinary culture. It can be national culture um, or a range of national cultures. Uh, and it is often very much entrenched in history. So it takes generations often to shift the focus of macro systems. And when you put all of these together, as I said, it's like concentric circles. And the reason why I very specifically chose this as the image rather than just that series of interlocking, uh, sorry, that series of concentric circles is that we can also bring into this uh, Gardamer's work which uh, talks about a life world and that aligns quite well with, with Bronfenbrenner, the idea that we are constructing our own realities and that is, a, that is the idea of the ecology but everybody's life world exists simultaneously both for them as an individual but also intersecting influencing and being influenced by everybody else's life world. So if you can imagine that each one of these little uh, ripples that's occurring in the picture here is a human being interacting with larger ripples that are perhaps maybe people with more influence, you can see already that the way in which your ecology will actually work with another person's ecology, there will be some times where there will be wonderful alignment. And those are the kinds of relationships where, which are very, very fruitful. Of course, 
as we all know, there are times where those concentric circles come together and then we actually end up with cracks around the edges as, as those kinds of life worlds actually bump up against each other. And often what you will find is that as a, re, as a reaction to that sort of challenge, sometimes our ecology will change. This is all part of this notion of development. And uh, Helen brings in here, wondering about the role of non-human actors in this. Most certainly. Um, I would say that things, I would say that a lot of the technology would probably fall in to the, the exo and the macro systems. So for example, um, if you are, let's take macro system at the highest level. If you are living in an area where you have very poor internet connection and not particularly good access to technological tools, then that's going to have a very serious effect on how you develop and how you interact with the rest of the world. If we take it down a notch to say exosystem, this could be the technological infrastructure or attitudes to technology that exist at your organization or your institution. So these are sort of things, and Penny mentions here about um, there being a, a problem in Australia. Yes, most certainly. And where I actually live, where I'm presenting from this morning, uh, despite the fact that we've been rolling out a national broadband scheme for the last several years, um, I have actually been on very poor internet connection since I moved out, and I only live 20 minutes away from the CBD of my town. Um, very poor internet connection where if I'm working from home, I'd actually have to restart my router at least three or four times before morning tea in order to get a stable internet connection. Um, so those those are the sorts of things that, that will all influence how, how we develop. Now, when we take a look at development, however, in the context of, of OEP, development is seen as a response to change in role. Whether that change is an actual change or a perceived change really doesn't matter because it, from the individual perspective within the ecology, all the individual has to do is perceive that their role within their larger ecology is actually changing to trigger a response for development. So we, we often look at open education as a catalyst for change. So there is this idea that it changes teaching models. So rather than being very much a teacher-centric model, the idea is that we would ideally like to be moving towards a student-centered model. There is an idea, especially around changing economic models, where we've moved from the notion of there being scarce experts, or at least there being an economic model of scarcity around education, to rather to what Martin Weller refers to as a pedagogy of abundance. So there are digitized materials which are available for free and are usually quite easily able to be accessed. So what this does then is it changes the landscape. And there's been quite a lot of discourse around the idea that, well, if the information is freely available and easily accessible, what then is the role of the teacher in all of this? And this is often what triggers the change of reality. So it is often a way, and he borrows very strongly from Piaget in this, that one of the greatest parts, or at least the, the greatest sign of human development, is the ability to conceptualize an aspirational reality and reconcile that with what is actually possible. So for us, if we perceive openness as a way of being a catalyst for new teaching methods, new ways of engaging with learners, new ways of working, new ways of researching, we have to have some method of being able to say, well, what does that look like? And when I can conceptualize what this looks like, part of that internal conceptualization is where do I fit in? What is my role? And then, of course, coming into there will be a whole range of the harsh realities, um, which can be things from your exosystem and from your macro system, which will then say, well, how fulsomely can I actually engage with any sort of development and change? 
The question that I have, however, and this is especially true around openness, I feel, is that what happens when an aspirational reality is simply too radical? Well, in short, I believe that what happens is it is rejected. It's something that people don't want to know about. So if we present openness, as some of the rhetoric does, as a highly disruptive uh, approach, as a way of explicitly challenging higher education models, or as something which is going to completely, as Sebastian Franz um, uh, claimed earlier, is going to completely destroy um, the, the type of work that we are actually doing, this is the point where our reactions are things like, well, that's nonsense, or I'm not going to engage. Um, after all, who's going to engage with an idea which actively positions itself as a way of doing you out of a job? Uh, so these are the sorts of things that I think that when we are positioning open education, we actually have to think about whether or not in this context is the aspirational reality of openness that I am actually trying to, to put forward here too radical for the group to embrace. And if it is, then maybe what, what you have to do, well, not maybe, what you have to do is tailor that positioning around the context. All stuff that I am sure that we very much do already implicitly, but I think that this is a way of making that thought process and that engagement explicit because what we don't want to do is get to the position where instead of moving our way out through the concentric circles as you see here we instead gaze very very purely at that center circle and just concentrate on the individual but rather what we would like people to do is is to look much further abroad so let's take it um, we're going to start to finish up now and take a look at how I'm going to be applying this to my own emerging research around this and what I've decided to do is that using Bronfenbrenner's ecology as a conceptual framework, I've indexed all of my survey questions. And to provide a little bit of background to the way in which I'm approaching this is that mine is a mixed methods research. It is using case study method uh, and will be multiple case study. I have four institutions in Australia that I'm going to be working with. And it will start off with a um, quantitative um, survey, which is indexed against the ecology. And I did see there that there was a, a mention um, Chrissy asks, I'm not using the ecosystem. I will be. Uh, I will be working my way all the way up. Um, this was more my pragmatist nature on what actually fit on that slide and could still be read. Uh, so, <laughs> so yes, I, I, I certainly didn't want to suggest that, uh, that, that I was ignoring the ecosystem, but very good question. Uh, so we have a quantitative survey, which is then going, the analysis of that is going to inform um, some semi-structured interviews where I'll be able to do a much deeper dive into the actual culture of a lot of these organizations and a lot of the perceptual values around openness. So for example, um, at the individual level, we have the demographic questions. So things like age, length of time employed in the HE sector, are they professional, are they academic staff? Moving into the micro system, um, these are things like the degree of level that they teach, the primary mode of teaching, do they teach primarily face-to-face, -face, blended, online um, and also interestingly there is this notion around ownership of the course design this came out of a Babson survey in 2015 where they asked around who has the decision-making power over the resources that are included in your course and interestingly in the North American um, area that they that they were um, polling people or surveying people around they found that there were a decent number of people who actually had no control over what the resources were and that rather the faculty had a direct say over what their teaching material were. Um, and to answer what, what Nick has put here, the four institutions that I'm dealing with are all universities, yes. Um, moving up into the, the MISO system, uh, we then start to talk about awareness of open resources, influence of commercial publishers over their course design, and also the types of material. So I have a lot of questions where I ask around what types of materials are actually 
in their course, uh, what are things that are self-authored, what are things which they have included from publishers, and what are things that are open in nature. And I think especially the role of commercial resources in this is a very important one because we, get, we are increasingly getting the issue in Australia where the publishers are very aggressively marketing complete packages. So in other words, you assign our textbook, we will then provide you with question banks, we will provide you with video content, we will provide you with lecture slides, all of these sorts of things um, that, that go into it in order to make this a very enticing proposition from the, the academic perspective that there, it becomes a very efficient sort of system. But as we've already seen, when we seek these kinds of efficiencies, the question of context and whether or not that is lost is another thing entirely. Now, I've got a few things here that, that people are, are bringing up. Um, will I include all staff, adjunct and permanent? Yes, there is a section where I ask whether or not they are um, casual, whether or not they are continuing full-time contract staff. Um, I haven't included adjunct, so I will include that in there. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, because in Australia, at least, the teaching staff for courses is becoming increasingly casualised. So this is something that we do need to deal with. Um, and when, when um, there's also a mention here from Penny that the teachers that you interview don't talk about openness, um, I completely agree with that because what I've tried to do very much, and this is part of why I'm piloting the survey very early on, I'll be piloting next week, um, is around the language because some people that I've talked to have actually said, no, I don't do anything with open education, but then you look at their lecture slides and they've got Creative Commons licensed images that they're using for an educational purpose, or they use a TED talk as a catalyst for discussion. And you say, well, actually, um, you know, far be it for me to, to put labels on your practice, but what you are doing does actually fall under open practice. It's just you don't actually use that term. So it's it's a very interesting space, I feel, that, that having people acknowledge these these sorts of things in their own practice and whether or not people are willing to accept that um, maybe people have a, have a fundamental um, problem with the idea of being described as an open practitioner. And uh, B, you said there, does it matter though? In my opinion, no, not at all. Uh, I don't mind what label we use. Uh, I don't care if there is no label. Um, uh, but the idea being that if people are aware of these kinds of resources and are aware of the types of working, that's perfectly fine. Um, in many ways, uh, this mirrors the open source software um, uh, situation, especially in Australia and New Zealand, where I know a number of people who are working with major corporations and they will o open the discussion with open source software and the, the corporation says, no, 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 we, we don't do that. All of our stuff is commercial. And that's the point where they say, well, actually, no, your HR system, that's built on this, which is open source. And your payroll system is actually built on this. That's open source as well. And it's gotten to the point where open source software is actually invisible but people use it. So in my mind, that's, that's a win. So I've already discussed here around the idea and, uh, and uh, around the mixed methods, multiple case study, and also the, the discussion here around the, the semi-structured interviews. But one of the things which I think is key in here is this notion of a, a methodology of friendship. Uh, and this is something that was put forward by Fontana and Frey around how to actually conduct semi-structured interviews, where the interviewer positions themselves as an advocate. And rather than trying to say, I am a completely neutral third party and I'll, I'll interview you about this, rather what they do is they say, I'm actually very keenly interested in what you do and I will actually I have a vested interest in using this type of information as a way to inform policy, as a way to actually create lasting social change. So by positioning yourself in that manner um, and taking that approach, I think this works very well for open practitioners, that we are in very many ways both researcher and advocate. 
and so finding something like this was was quite a, a godsend for me because uh, it aligned with all of my uh, perceptions around what my role in the research is. So that's where I am at the moment. But as far as moving into the future, uh, I'm piloting my survey in the coming weeks. Um, and then, of course, the ethics amendments and the like. And then most of this year will actually be spent on data collection and analysis. So I'm hoping that at some stage, maybe next year, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm doing this part time, so I'm being incredibly optimistic here. Uh, but maybe next year there might be a possibility that I might be able to approach the the GOGN and maybe give an update on where I am from here. Uh, and I'll finish as all good future gazing does with a quote from William Gibson, uh, the author of Neuromancer. Now the future is already here, and if we consider that this future is open, uh, it's not. It's just not evenly distributed. So as I wrap up, I would like to just have, have a quick thanks to uh, Dr. Karina Bossu at the University of Tasmania, who are um, who is my supervisor in this, and also Dr. Megan Keck, who is um, <clears throat> at the University of Southern Queensland and has been incredibly generous with her time uh, in talking about ecologies. Um, so I think, B, I'll hand back over to you. Uh, because we've already proven from the very beginning that you know putting me in control of this is not a good idea. Thank you very much. It's it's um, um, it, one of the things that um, amazes me the most since since we said that I think Beck we probably um, agree with me with this is we took over um, from the OU in the Netherlands and Fred Mulder like the academic coordination of, of the Goji and I'm learning lots and I am I am full of admiration and and I think it's great the the, the enormous variety of uh, methodologies and different theories that all you like this 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 case your case Adrian is is is, is a perfect example but I can extend it to uh, most of, of, of our PhD researchers on, on the GOGN is this enormous variety uh, of, of theory coming in and the methodology coming in to 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 study openness and to look at, at, at openness so um, I, I find that it's the more I, every time I come to one of these presentations, I want to go out and read more about. So definitely, this methodology of friendship, I think, is going to be very valuable to a lot of us. A lot of us. Um, I'll open the floor. We still have a few minutes for questions. So, are there any questions there, uh, guys? Use the chat and write your question on the chat if. If you may, please, let me see what comes out there. I'm going to mute myself again. Well, thank thank you for all of the uh, the kind thoughts down the bottom, everybody. Um, so uh, Chris has asked around my research questions. Now, the the research questions that I had originally put forward in my candidature um, are undergoing quite a bit of change as a result of this. But at the very core, uh, I am looking at what what are the influencing factors, so the barriers and enablers of openness at these institutions. I am looking at the, the level to which people are engaging with open educational practice. I'm looking at um, how should Australian higher education institutions support practitioners who are seeking to engage with open practice. And lastly, um, how the documented Australian experience differs from other geographic regions. So those are my four key areas, but how I'm articulating those research questions is actually, um, is actually morphing over time. Yes, and good. A few people are saying there. Yes, of course they will change. Um, and uh, yes, that was something that was was actually quite a surprise to me because when I went for candidature and I put them forward, uh, and then a couple of months later I said to my supervisor, um, "Okay, I've had a look at these again, and I think that they need to change. Is this a problem?" And she was completely overjoyed uh, and said to me, "Of course it's not a problem. This is actually really good progress." Uh, so getting it into my head that everything is up for change. Okay, and I've got it. Penny, uh, who said that she was, she's had a chapter 
circu uh, that there was a chapter circulated on Twitter this week, week about a conceptual framework that was excellent. If you manage to find that, uh, Penny, uh, again, maybe if you can send that out via um, Twitter and maybe uh, if you tag the, the GOGN because that sort of information share I think would be really useful. I have a question in the meantime uh, while people are yes. typing away because yes. I wonder when we're talking about different uh, frameworks of, of um, open educational practices, I, I wonder to what extent do you think applying um, all these levels that you're talking about, how is that, is that going to throw any light or is there any light to be thrown? Um, I see what, what are the like the the the, the differences then they, I'm just looking at I'm just trying to make sense like what is the difference between basically uh, what do we think of OEP in in the UK and what do we think of OEP in South Africa what do we think of OEP in in Australia if we are looking at it if this framework that you propose is going to help us look at it and come up with something that applies to everyone independently can we actually get to that that level of 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 agreeing this is what OEP is about? Um, see, do you see, see what I mean? Yeah, I, I I do I do, and I suppose that I don't think that there is any sort of grand unified theory of openness, um, and that's that's really not not going to be my focus, but rather it's around the idea of um, of understanding things at the various levels of the ecology as a way of differentiating practice. And I think that as a tool that maybe an institution could use to say, well, we are actually very serious about engaging with open practice. Now, the university that I'm at, um, we have got a whole heap of pockets of really good open practice. And at this point, one of my um, tasks is actually to try and look for an institutional way forward. And so a large portion of what I'm going to be leveraging this for is to say, well, is there actually an institutional identity that comes out of all of this material at the individual level? The other thing that I think that it is a really good catalyst for thought around is, uh, for example, I work with the OERU in New Zealand because USQ is, is one of their key partners um, or one of their earlier partners. And when I speak to the director there, Wayne McIntosh, we've had a lot of discussions around, well, who are the kinds of people who we imagine will be taking these courses? Because for, for my perspective, when I'm designing a course, I like to know who the learners are and then design for the learners. And of course, we've, we've had a lot of very good discussions around, around who the potential learners are. And I think that when you start to say, well, what is actually happening within their own ecologies and what are the contextual factors that influence them to engage as a learner with open education, the question becomes, how then do we use that meaningful for educational design? Uh, so I think that part, part of what I'm after is, is really a method or a tool that can be used from a variety of perspectives to inform practice at either the individual, institution, or even larger. And I, I do know that um, somebody else mentioned here whether or not I was doing a, a consolidated case study. I'm actually, the multi-site um, case study that I'm doing, so four institutions, I am actually keeping those cases separately and dealing with each um, each site, each case study site, as a separate entity, because I'm I'm actually uh, leaning very heavily on uh, on both Stake and Yin's approach to case studies, where the idea is that be very careful of generalizations and whether or not you can actually make them from case study research, and the idea that a case explains a case. And that when you start to aggregate things, it is actually possible at that point to, to start to generalize when you really shouldn't be. And yes, Stake 1995, yes, that's the one that I'm using.
Thank you. There's uh, there's a question from from Catherine. Uh, you may have to scroll up on the chat. Um, she says she says you seem to be embracing both the open researcher and openness advocate advocate hats. Is that right? What do you see as the challenges in relation to that? I think that I think that as part of that, you've got to be very careful that um, that you have a very critical view of openness, and that you're very clear about where you stand. So one of the one of the um, items that I really really like um, that informs my own practice is the subtitle of David Wiley's blog, which says pragmatism before zeal. And so the, this idea that um, I, I tend to be very moderate in the way in which I approach openness and I often put it in, in the idea of right tool for the right job. So we don't shoehorn open practices into something where they clearly are not the answer. If proprietary material or commercial material is actually the best possible thing at this moment, then use it. Okay, so so zealotry around openness is something that I definitely don't don't embrace or engage with. So to answer the question, one, if you're going to be both advocate and researcher, I think you have to have a very critical perspective and have people around you who are going to challenge your own notions of openness. And I'm very fortunate to work in a an entire division where openness is explicitly part of our strategic plan. Uh, and it trickles down to the idea that our Pro Vice Chancellor has said that openness across our division is everybody's business and everybody has a role, everyone must know something about it, even if it is to the extent that they have an idea of what is out there and what can be used and they may need to follow up, they may need to connect with me. But in that kind of an environment, I have uh, 142 other people who at any given time can be coming into me and going, okay, well, I have a big problem with this aspect of openness. And then you've got to engage with that from their perspective. So if you're going to be both researcher and advocate, uh, that critical perspective is, uh, is, is, uh, is an absolute must. And while Nick says that we are as part of a strange utopia that I live in, um, I probably present it a little bit more rosy than, than it actually is. Um, I'm certainly not going to say that it is not without challenge. Uh, and I have actually been in faculty meetings when, when, uh, when I've actually talked to people about open practice. And I, I actually had one, one of a, a disciplinary group actually say to me, we are point blank not engaging with this. We are not sharing our content because our content is our competitive advantage. Um, and after I'd picked my jaw back up off the ground uh, from hearing such a thing, um, then actually having to, to engage with that kind of a, a, an idea that content and the quality of their content was actually their differentiation. Uh, so I, I've got a whole range of different practice across the university. So if I kind of put USQ as this kind of utopia, no, um, but it's certainly well predisposed towards openness, which makes my life very, very much easier, as well as having some very high level champions like a deputy vice chancellor or vice chancellor who believe very strongly in this. Uh, Nick says, yeah, I believe he may have had the same discussion, maybe even the same people. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Chrissy asks what the biggest challenges are. Um, I think that really it is the distributed nature of Australian higher education. Um, even though we only have 42 universities in Australia, a uh, population of 25 million, uh, we are very geographically distributed. So being able to engage meaningfully with people at a distance is probably going to be the biggest challenge. Uh, fortunately, access to things like Skype uh, and also access to um, both my professional network and the professional networks of people who have very kindly agreed to, uh, to support me in this um, is going to mitigate that slightly. But I can see that building those relationships at a distance is probably going to be one of the most challenging things. 
and we also have here a, a mention about the, the the loss of the OLT so for those of you who don't who don't know the OLT or Office of Learning and Teaching um, is a was sorry until last year the federally funded education uh, research grants these were both the recognition for excellence in teaching but also they provided grants uh, for uh, for the country um, and a lot of the grants it was actually um, becoming increasingly competitive I think just before the office closed down I think we were down to about a 17% success rate um, so they were incredibly competitive but the good thing that the OLT did and I would very much hope is being carried on to whatever new body is taking on the role is that they made it federally legislated that um, the reports um, and things like your data and, and the like uh, were all openly licensed because they embraced the idea that this was taxpayer money and so we shouldn't be asking taxpayers to pay twice for the funding that they're for the uh, the expenditure that's already being made so true so true um, okay I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this to to a close because we, we we're getting closer to 9 p.m. here in the UK. Um, thank you, Adrian. It's been very interesting. It's been fantastic. And I actually look forward to next year to see basically what's 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 happened. Uh, for everybody else, please join me in giving Adrian a big clap because a big applause because it's 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 well worth it. I think it actually works. If you present, um, I don't know how, how different your presentation is going to be in, in front of um, you know to your your bunch of academics next week. But I think it works really really well. It's been you know it's it's like you tell a really good story as well, which is uh, which is excellent. Uh, so thank you thank you everybody for for coming. The recording will be up on the Gojian YouTube channel probably tomorrow morning. Um, thank you again. Thank you to Adrian. Thank you to everybody for coming. And uh, hopefully I'll see you or I'll read your comments next uh, next next month. In the meantime, if anyone has has any problems, any comments, any questions, do. Drop me a line. For those of you who don't know about the GoGN, we are the GoGN. So it's the, the website is go-gn. So gogn.net. Go and check it up. And if you if 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 you have any questions, get get in touch. So again, thanks thanks very much. And uh, good night, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is for you. Thank you. And thank you everybody for engaging and being a, a marvelous group of people to learn from. Okay, thank you very much.